My investigations begin in a city of cubes, in a game called Minecraft. Minecraft is deceptively simple. The gameplay centers around two mouse buttons. Left click destroys the one meter cubes that make up nearly everything in the world. Right click places new cubes. It's somewhere between first person shooter and a big bin of Lego bricks. But from this simple concept grows an infinite variety of activity. As I began to play the game, it brought to mind so many ideas I had come across in my studies of architecture. In Minecraft, I saw unfold an interactive version of the utopias of Archigram, of Yona Friedman, of Cedric Price, of Constant, and the Situationists. Let me explain by looking back to those moments as sources of contemplation and inspiration for what we can do with tools available to us today. Let's begin with Constant and his new Babylon. New Babylon was born out of a line of thinking held in common with many other mid-century utopias. The idea was that technology would advance to a point such that all forms of human labor and work could be automated, leaving people with an abundance of leisure time, free to play to a point that the competitive system of capitalism would be obsolete. Constant imagined a megastructure where, quote, under one roof with the aid of movable elements, a shared residence is built, a temporary, constantly remodeled living area, a camp for nomads on a planetary scale. New Babylon was the land of homo ludens, man at play. We have not seen their society come to fruition, perhaps because the demand that it occur on a planetary scale is too radical for it to come into being over the course of a half century or so, at least in the real world. But the virtual nature of games enables experimentation with space on a scale and with a level of immersion not possible on paper or in architectural models. This means there is an opportunity to test and evaluate plans before announcing their impending success. In this context, consider one of Constance's declarations. The exploration and creation of the environment will then happen to coincide because in creating his domain to explore, Homo Lunens will apply himself to exploring his own creation. Thus, we will be present at an uninterrupted process of creation and recreation sustained by a generalized creativity that is manifest in all domains of activity. Now contrast that with a frank summary of gameplay principles by Minecraft's creator, Notch. Free building mode is fine and dandy, but for many people, it will ultimately become boring once you've got it figured out. It's like playing a first-person shooter in god mode or giving yourself infinite funds in a strategy game. A lack of challenge kills the fun. So yes, Minecraft is New Babylon, because we see people creating and exploring within a structure designed for maximum recombination, but it also provides points to critique New Babylon's assumptions about human nature, because Minecraft is not just a vision, but an experiment. The designer of the game sets parameters, field conditions, and we get to run this sort of experiment and see what actually happens. And part of what we see is that with all the potential for automation in the world, some humans still strive to invent new forms of work. There are several videos on YouTube demonstrating the invention of factories built in-game, twisting the parameters set by the game's creator to create something wholly unexpected. Here, the player is rapidly building a wall by exploiting the fact that in Minecraft, stone is formed where hot lava, hot lava and water meet. While Constant was involved with the Situationist International for much of the time he was working on New Babylon. This brings us to our next stop, with Guy Debord writing in 1959, describing the Situationist theory of unitary urbanism as a critique of urban geography. Unitary urbanism is opposed to the fixation of people at certain points in the city. It is the foundation for a civilization of leisure and play. One should note that in the shackles of the current economic system, technology has been used to further multiply the pseudo-games of passivity and social disintegration and television, while the new forms of playful participation that are made possible by this same technology are regulated and policed. In reading this, we must keep in mind that at this point in time, computer still means IBM mainframe, and media means the one-way broadcast mechanism of television. But of course, the uses of technology in our world have changed since then. 
In the forums of massively multiplayer video games, we can find conversations about societal values and economic systems that engage far more people than DeBoard's interventions against the society of the spectacle ever could have. When the anarcho-communists of Minecraftia take a stance against the introduction of an in-game currency system and stand contrary to the civil people of survival's commitment to law and order, this is not a passive uptake of our current economic system. This is the use of computationally enabled role-playing and simulation to confront timeless issues of societal organization. So who knows how DeBoard would have felt had he been around today? But it does seem that architect Cedric Price designed during slightly different times. His fun palace is a dynamic open-air structure consisting of gantry cranes and movable elements controllable by the anticipated leisure seekers of post-industrial London. The design held much in common with other utopian plans. Modular elements, reconfigurability, emphasis on structure and activity over a permanent form. But unlike some of the other projects, his utopia was highly technological going as far as to bring on a cybernetician to advise the design team. To imagine what it would be like to play inside this almost-built machine, one has to look no further than the various video games on the market today. Other designers of the avant-garde, such as Arkazoom, saw the expanse of the computer as a tool for generating architectural forms, drawing pseudo-plans for their no-stop city over computer punch tapes. But somewhere along the way, we lost the explicit spirit that says, architecture is computational, computers are architectural. In Minecraft, I see that these ideas seem ready to converge again. New societies are being generated as urban scale machines are built in game space. Recently, a material called Redstone was added to the game, which allows for the simulation of digital transistor-like circuits. The Minecraft community has documented the combination of these elements required to produce different types of logic gates and elementary computing mechanisms. Some players have taken this to the extreme, constructing entire functional computers that become cities unto themselves. From above, this Minecraft computer looks like a hybrid of a medieval walled city and a contemporary metropolis. As its, as its uh, operator navigates to the input stage, he takes a ride on an integrated subway system. This underscores the urban scale of this functional machine, a machine which exemplifies computation as a spatial experience. So from this as a starting point, I endeavor to look at video games and the great urban technologies of mobile devices as a chance to revisit these past utopian visions. Technology available today presents us with the opportunity to reconnect the alluring spaces of these games with the spaces of the real city, where there is a chance for real revolution to take place. My particular technology of choice is called augmented reality. Computer vision, 3D graphics, and location-aware mobile devices combine to provide an overlay of the virtual onto the real. The idea is that as you look through the screen of your mobile device, you see not only the image your camera is capturing, but an additional layer of photo-matched geometry. The algorithms identify regions of interest, calculate the relative angle and position of the camera, then render the 3D scene from that position and combine the images into a composite of virtual and real. These images were generated by a prototype of the system I've built that fuses a live, re a live view of the Minecraft world with a live view of our real world here outside the building where I work. Players can build with blocks in and around a model of the studios here and then view their creations by moving around a laptop with a, le with a webcam in the physical space. Obviously, this experience would be more fluid with the software running on an iPhone or similar device, and this is certainly one of the next steps. Now, one of the other limitations is that the system uses the most readily available open source augmented reality framework, one that is trained only to recognize the distinct patterns of black and white fiducial markers. But the facades of buildings could, with a few software tricks, become urban scale machine readable patterns, eliminating the need to place additional markers on the scene at all. This is especially relevant in places where physical augmentation is explicitly outlawed. With wide use of an urban augmented reality toolkit such as this, 
it would create additional dimensions for designers to consider when drawing up the image of public spaces. Should a given surface hinder or enhance the ability to augment it virtually? The development of such a toolkit tuned to the needs of a user in a city rather than a researcher in a laboratory is something I hope to continue work on. But ar architects have been augmenting reality for a long time, at least in still images. These photo montages by Yona Friedman capture the idea of a seemingly infinite space frame grid layered on top of an existing city. The hand-drawn lines converge on the same horizon as the photograph, unless they seem to fit in, even if the level of realism does not match. Now, if augmented reality were just about doing this computationally for single images, it would be nothing radically different than what has been done in the past. But as a real-time interactive experience, the image can change not only as you move around the scene, but as other players in the virtual space jump, run, climb, build, and modify the environment before your very eyes. I would liken the shift as similar to the production of real-time 3D graphics in general for games, in movies, for architectural work, for architectural walkthroughs, and how they have generated wholly new interactive media experiences, even though the technical feat is just a speeding up of the production of linear perspective images, fundamentals to art since the Renaissance. By moving from passive viewer of images to immersed, immersed participant in a game of dynamic image cre creation, augmented reality has the potential to change the experience of being in, or more profoundly, being a citizen of the city. Now, 3D perspective renderings are not only the only relevant tool used by the utopianists to a project of urban augmented reality. In 1956, the independent group staged an exhibition of future thinking work in a show simply titled, This is Tomorrow. The exhibition catalog for this proto-mid-century utopia included an image by Richard Hamilton composed of figures and domestic consumer objects cut out from magazine advertisements of the day. This was an early use of collage as a tool to reimagine what architecture and cities could become, a tool that used the sudden onslaught of photographic images in post-war popular culture to project a picture of future society. The trend is nowhere illustrated better than with British architectural group Archigram. Collage and utopia come together in projects such as their Instant City, a conception of urbanism that suggests the importation of large movie screens as the fundamental precondition to generate urban space. Celebrities' faces, vacation goers, picturesque landscapes, and other miscellaneous icons of pop culture construct a scene that captures the spirit of the anticipated leisure society, which would necessitate such architectural inventions. Today, our experience of image culture has moved beyond magazines. With the advent of Photoshop, everyday folks have been recombining readily available digital images and inventing new forms of cultural expression as they go along. The act of digital collage becomes a sort of turn-based network game between uncountable strangers across the world who may or may not be aware that they are acting as cultural producers. And like the gamers of Minecraft, they're almost most certainly unaware of the utopian spirit that once drove such activity. And though the result could easily appear extremely dystopian at first glance, a combination of urban augmented reality tools and Google image search could generate games which channel the energies of image culture on the web into rethinking the image of the city, launching found images onto building surfaces, as shown here, for example. The web has taught us to look, where, to, look to where high and lowbrow forces meet to generate some of the most fascinating movements and phenomena of our day. So it's not my goal to glorify video games as high art in themselves, but to suggest that they can be used as mechanisms of mass cultural engagement at a scale hardly imaginable for the avant-garde artists and designers of the last century. Now, one group that was particularly keen on interacting with pop culture was California-based Ant Farm. They took on mass media with parodies of consumerism and television culture and created sites for new experiences and countercultural modes of production with their inflatables. The inflatables were architectural interventions used to host happenings and alternative media events, documented with never before available consumer grade video equipment like the Sony PortaPak camera. Inflatables were made of cheap polyethylene film and constructed in a manner accessible to nearly everyone. 
Ant Farm's Inflate a Cookbook documents how to make many different forms with this method and seems to suggest a utopia of never-ending temporary zones for these happenings to pop out of the back, backs of vans across the country. They felt the non-rectilinear geometry of the inflatables would raise a certain type of bodily awareness that was conducive to their countercultural goals. So on one level, there's this formal intervention, but these bulbous forms did not always represent something purely phenomenological. Perhaps the most prominent figure in mid-century utopianisms was Buckminster Fuller, whose bold thinking had a strong influence on Ant Farm, amongst others. For Fuller, architectural augmentations in the city were not about changing culture, but about increasing the quantifiable performance of the built environment. His proposition for a gigantic dome to be built over Manhattan forms a striking image, but it was founded on calculations that doing so would reduce the heat loss through the building's skins, minimizing energy use. And now with augmented reality, we have a chance to simulate both what it would look and feel like inside these non-traditional structures, as well as to visualize and manage how they would perform technically. This is an opportunity to make visible the patterns of social and cultural flows alongside the flows of energy and other infrastructural data. So while some trends in architecture and urbanism promote computation as a tool for mindless form making that lends itself as much to the design of shoes as it does to the design of cities, I see instead an opportunity to increase both our computational and spatial literacies to enhance our ability to read and write to program spaces and the machines that interact with them. Now, rather than playing the old situationist game of psychogeography where one navigates the city of, say, Paris by using the map of London, can we invent a new game where the infrastructure, the infrastructure of one city is programmed to behave like that of another? Rather than remain the armchair mayors solving imagined problems in a game like SimCity, can we take our collective augmentations of urban infrastructure out into the field where they might connect with our daily experiences? As I walk across the freeway to get to school here in San Diego, my mind sometimes drifts back to my days in Boston, imagining how distances between places here would feel if connected by that city's subway system. The ability to rewire and programmatically simulate changes in infrastructure with an open-endedness found in the free building games like Minecraft and a spirit encouraging derivative works is found in collage culture and the juxtaposition with the real image of the city enabled by augmented reality technologies begins to suggest something beyond situation of psychogeography. So with this, I propose as the project of our time, the production of new games of cyber geography. <laughs>